All right, folks, we'll be getting started in just a moment. Thanks for commenting, telling us where you're from. Hi, Karen. I was in Clearwater two nights ago doing a little presentation for Karen's Quilt Guild, and she is logged in. Hi, Barbara from East South Orlando, and Connie from Bronson, Florida. I don't know if I've ever heard of Bronson, Florida. I have to tell us where that's where that is. We've got Gainesville. We've got Donna Hago. Donna, I can't say that. Georgia. <laughs> uh, lots of lots of people logging in from all kinds of places. Thank you so much for letting us know. Here we are. Very good. Thanks for joining us. And I'm sure more people will join as we go along. You have arrived at Tips, Tools, and Techniques. And we are live from Maitland, Florida, the sewing studio in Maitland, Florida. And we're really glad you're here. I've got a few announcements before we get started. Uh, let's see. We have a discount sheet for everything I talk about today at Tips, Tools, and Techniques. There will be a discount uh, that you can use online and is, as always, TTT. And it is good until the end of Sunday. Sorry, my nose itches. Did I introduce myself? I'm Mary Janine Hibarquin, and this is TTNT. So we've got a discount code, TTNT. Just put that into your, or into your coupon code. We've got my favorites page. So as I talk about some different things and you may want to, some of the things are free patterns, but some of the things you may want to order. And my favorites page, Gabrielle is going to put the link up for us in the comments, but it, um, so you can just click on that and you can see all the different things that I will be talking about. And then finally, uh, the handout, if you would like to print out the handout or watch it from another device, Gabrielle is going to put that link up and it is a three page handout. So you may want to either print that out or pull it up on another device so you can follow along. And yeah, those are, oh, and then Shop Hop, of course, if you're, if you're still Shop Hopping, you've got to the end of April. I've actually talked to three or four people that have done all 60 shops in Florida. They put 3,000 miles on their car. It just, yeah, just blows me away. You could go to, you can go to LA for that many miles. So that's a lot of miles, a lot of, lot of fun. And we've had a lot of visitors here to the store, over a thousand, I think, um, which has been awesome. And yeah, so we've got a few more weeks to see if you can at least get in a few regions or the whole or the whole state. And then finally, I wanted to let you know that I'm glad to be here, but I won't be at TTT again until August. I'm leaving mid-May for a few months trip. We're gonna take our camper up to the Great Lakes. And we, I won't be back until the end of July. And so I'll be back for August. We also are talking about a Christmas in August and we're looking at which weekend it's gonna be in August. I don't wanna say a date because then we may have to change it, but it's gonna be a weekend in August, so Christmas in August. So, so uh, keep an eye out for that. Altamont Springs, that's where I used to live. And hope they left me food for last night, no. I got one chicken tender and then everything was closed down, but that was enough. There was a little picnic at my church and I, I missed out. Um, that's okay. Um, we've got more Georgia. Thank you all for joining. Um, Tony says there's no picture. I'm sure we are. I, it's okay. I think it might be your device. You might want to hit the refresh button and see and see if you can get a picture. Okay. Onward bound. We're, let's, let's, uh, let's talk about some, let's get into some content here. Uh, and I will re-tell you about the handouts and the favorites page every once in a while in case you're coming in late. I'm first going to talk about um, this three pocket tote. Some of you have seen me talk about this before because it is a winner. So it's a little pocket tote. Let's see, there's a pocket here, there's a pocket at the top, and then you flip it over and there's another pocket. And let's back it up here, Gabriella, because I want to tell you that all that whole thing is made with one square uh, bound. So I've got quilting fabric, quilting fabric, maybe some batting in between, and you put a binding on it. Any size square will work, but it's got to be a square. It can't be a rectangle. So here's what happens. We're going to take this square and we're going to fold it in half on the diagonal. All right. I'm gonna sew a line here and sew a line here. I'm not gonna give you those numbers because they're in the pattern, which happens to be $2.50. I think you can afford that. It's a two page cardstock pattern. So that is on my favorites page. It looks 
The favorites, the very first item on my favorites page, it's not a very good picture. One of these days we got to get a better picture, but it you'll, you'll see it. You'll see it there. Um, anyway, so we draw the two lines and now we are, oops, I haven't redone this from the last time I showed it. So here it is folded in half on the diagonal. Watch carefully. I'm going to put my hand inside. This is actually the pretty side. This is actually the outside of the bag. I'm going to put my hand inside, push it against the corner and magic. I end up with a bag. There's a pocket. There's a pocket. And on the other side is the third pocket. Yes, you got to throw a few tack marks in. You got to tack the corners. You got to tack either side. I like to put a piece of Velcro here. And then if you wanted to put a pretty button, you could. Um, my recommendation is you, if you don't have any um, handle type. This is a crossbody bag, by the way. Let's back it up here. It's a crossbody bag. And I love these bags for going to quilt shows. If I just, you know, a couple of things, your credit cards, your phone, your lipstick, maybe a few business cards, whatever. It fits perfectly. You can make them any size. Again, um, I also have one that I, can you make it with cork? Yes, you can, Samantha. Let me, let me just say this before I forget it. I have one of these that I use. I ride my e-bike to work. And so each pocket has just a few things. And then I can swing it around when I'm riding my bike. And it is a beautiful thing. I don't have to carry my heavy handbag to work. To work. I've made it with cork, Samantha, but I made the mistake of putting cork on both sides with some batting and it was way too thick. So then I took it apart, took out the batting and made it with two pieces of cork. It was still too thick. I don't know why I thought I had to have two pieces of cork. So my recommendation is if you were to make this, do it with one layer of cork and one layer of quilting fabric and no batting. That's That would be substantial enough. I'm going to talk a little later about soft and stable. And somebody asked me if I could use soft and stable. Again, I think it would make it a little too sturdy. I think you want it a little softer than that. I mean, you could try it, but see what you think with just two layers of cotton, quilting cotton and batting. Let me just show you some more examples that I just have happened to have. This one is made with selvages. So yellow selvages. I still haven't put a handle on it. By the way, the handle is um, just literally just hand sewed to the inside pocket. You could, of course, machine sew it. And I, I might have machined it. I don't remember. Anyway, I've even left the tape still on it so it doesn't fray. But that's just hand sewed down. And of course, this is a crossbody bag. It doesn't have to be. I just feel comfortable when I have a small bag making it a crossbody bag. It's just for me, it's easier than putting it on my shoulder. I feel like I'm, I'm completely hands free if it's a crossbody bag. But that one's up to you. Here's another one in pink that is um, made out of selvages. Somebody was asking me today, she was kind of a new sewer. She didn't understand how selvages worked. So I was telling her, you can take a back fabric, lining fabric, some batting, and then sew the selvages right to that. When you get to the big enough, you know, trim it out to be a square and bind it. So the way the selvages work, actually that's the top. The way the selvages work, I mean, let's do an overhead camera is I'm going to lay down my first selvage with the side that has its fin the finished side is going to be right up against the right up against the edge and then I'm going to lay on top the next selvage. So this selvage here is sewn down um, on top of the color from the previous one. So they're overlapped, they're not seamed. And then coming up here, that's the next um, finish, you know, your, your selvage is the finish, so you don't need to seam it because it has a finish already. So again, there was some color, that little plaid there was getting covered up by the next selvage. So the more color you cut off your selvages, the more color you're going to have on your final product. You can see some of these have color and some of these are right up against the edge. There's, there's no extra fabric at all. So it's just up to you how you want to cut your selvages off. Um, I don't, I don't cut selvages because I want them. I cut them just because that's the end of the fabric. But sometimes there's a lot of color left and sometimes there's not very much at all. Hopefully that, that answered the question. If you have any other questions about selvage or this bag, let me know. But it is the coolest bag. Um, I was talking about it uh, February. So just back up here. February, we did tips, tools, and techniques. But because everybody was at the Daytona show, the AQS show, we didn't have any 
anybody that could help with tech. So I didn't do the online version of this just over just next door in the event room. And so there was a few things I talked about that I just really, really felt strongly I wanted to show you online. And that's why I'm talking about this stuff. Um, that was February. And then, of course, March, I was sick. Sorry, I missed you guys. I did miss you guys because I would have rather been here than sick. But um, I'm back and I don't plan on I, it's the first time I've called in sick in 21 years. Seriously, I was I had a great record. Oh, well. Um, OK, so that was uh, that was the folded pocket tote. Two dollars and fifty cents. It's amazing. Um, highly recommend it once you start making, make one with the size she recommends. And then after that, you'll know how to make it and you can make them any size. All right. If you have any, if you don't have any questions, we're just going to go. Um, yeah. All right. So my next, my next thing, I, I keep promising that I was going to talk about this and here we are I'm finally getting, this is my little hand sewing kit that I take with me on my trips. And I have several different English paper piecing projects and some other things that I'm working on you know, different threads, different needles. But I want to talk about our threaders. No, I don't usually carry two threaders, but I put them both in here so I could talk about them. I've been using the Clover threader, and I'll show you how they work in a moment. I've been using this one for years and years, but I'll be honest, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I was at a, a lecture last summer, and she was saying that the Bohin, I think that's how you say it, B-O-H-I-N, it's on my favorites page, she was saying how this one is a game changer and it works much better and it absolutely does. So I'm gonna talk about this one. It has, let's see if we can get in there nice and tight. Um, it has two different size holes for two different size needles. So this would be for the larger needle and this for a smaller needle, but you press the one button and it kind of, it does both at the same time. So Gabriella, just stay right there. I'm gonna pull, put my glasses on and get a needle out. This better work since I'm on live TV, right? Okay, so I'm putting, of course, the end with the hole in, in it. I'm gonna put it in the bigger one. All right, so there's my, there's my needle. I'm gonna take yellow silk thread. I love sewing with silk, by the way. It's just, it goes through fabric like butter. Kind of just push it down, make sure it's, it's down. And then we press this center button, it threads my needle. Wow. Good job on the camera. That is perfect. Look at that. So it threaded the needle. I kind of hold it with my hold it with my finger till I disengage it. And then you can just pull this loop through and there it is threaded. So when I'm in the car and everything's moving fast, a great way to thread my needles. This I, I do this when I'm when I'm when he's driving, I'm sewing, and this is how I can thread a needle in the car because it's a bumpy car. So if you don't have a, a needle threader for hand sewing, and Mary Janine, I would never hand sew, not in a million years, that's okay. But if you are any kind of hand sewer at all, highly recommend a threader so you're not having to deal with those tiny holes all by yourself. So you like my cute little, cute little hand sew box. That's what I carry with me. All right, let me know if you have questions. Um, cold in Maine since returning from Florida on Wednesday, I bet it is. And Pam won't let me link for the handout suggestion. So we'll, we'll, we'll give you that link for the handout. And if you've just joined us, you're going to either want to print the handout or bring it up on another device so you can keep an eye on it. Um, I'm going to get to that handout. One more thing, and then we're going to get to the quilt behind me, which is on the handout. All right. So let's talk about a really cool wallet. You know, I talk about carrying these these um, bags around. And so it's nice to have a little wallet that goes inside them. I don't need my wallet that has every, every little bit of everything that I usually carry. I just need, you know, cash, credit card, driver's license. So this is what it looks like. Here's the pattern. And this is what it looks like. I've made a little one out of rifle paper and I should have had a different colors here, but there's a pocket here. There's a pocket here. And there's a pocket here. It actually comes with a fourth one with a little change purse, but I don't usually, oh, this one actually has that change purse thing, but I don't usually do that. I usually just have the three pockets and then cash, credit cards, whatever. But this little pocket here is sewn an inch on either side. So the change is less likely to come out. I just 
Normally I'll just put change in my pocket, in my, on my pants. Um, of course, I'm using a little uh, piece of Velcro and notice the way I've got this piece of Velcro going this way and this one going this way. That way, if your wallet gets stuffed with lots of ones or fives or tens, you've got a little space to make this, it gets a little bigger without losing the action of the Velcro. So that's an idea. There's a little tip for you. I also rounded the corners. Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't round the corners. It tells you in the pattern. I love this pattern because it's one sheet of paper. You don't have to lose all the little bits of paper. So you open it up and it tells you the sizes to cut. And then I'm going to do a, just a quick little demonstration on how the wallet is constructed. I encourage you to buy the pattern because she's got lots of good tips and details. So she tells you to cut four different rectangles for the pockets. But again, I don't usually cut those rectangles. Um, at this time, I only did three because I don't have that little coin purse. I'm going to fold them in half and stitch across the top. So there it is three times. Well, here it is. I've cut the pieces and this is before I folded them and stitched across the top. But there's the piece. And I'm not going to give you the numbers because that's uh, in the pattern. You can buy the pattern. Um, so you're going to stitch across all three of them. So now that's kind of a unit. Those are your pockets. You're going to take one big piece. That's the outside of your bag. Uh, so leftovers from a dress I was making. Um, and you fold it in half. And at this point, you can put a little interfacing on it. But I came up with the idea, instead of interfacing, to use what we call RFID fabric. And if you ever heard these stories on the news where people can read your credit card from just walking by you or in the elevator or whatever, they can, they can scan your credit card right out, of your wall, right out of your pocket, right out of your thing. And so if you ever travel or look at travel magazines, you'll see RFID wallets. This is a fabric that we have here that, that al doesn't allow people to scan through it. There's, there's some kind of technology in there. I'm, I don't know what that is, but it's, it's a shiny, thin, metallic-y fabric, but it, you can use it as interfacing, which is what I did here. So when I'm finished with the project, my credit cards are completely, are completely wrapped up in the RFID on the, on the front and the back. And so then I don't have to worry about anybody reading my credit card when I'm out and about. So if you're ever making wallets or small purses that you want to, um, you have to think about your credit card, you want to get some RFID fabric. This is what it looks like. We, um, we have it by the yard, but I asked if we could have a bunch of fat quarters cut because really, a fat quarter is going to last you a really long time. I mean, I've made about six or seven um, wallets and I still have this much left over. So if you were to make a larger purse, of course, you'd need more. So we have the by the yard and also by the fat quarter on my favorites page. It's all, all of $8.17 minus your 15% discount. So if you're even thinking about making a wallet, you might want to get some RFID fabric. And again, you could just use it like interfacing. So once I sew and this, and she tells you, this is where you would put interfacing and then you flip this around and it's not, um, you know, it's not, un, un, uh, it's not, it's, it's fine. It's fine. It's nice inside. It's not, it doesn't weird. It doesn't make it weird or stiff or anything like that. And then you just follow the directions about how you um, stack everything up, sew it, and then sew some Velcro on. If you wanted to put a pretty button there, you could. However, I feel like I want this to be as trim and slim and easy to pull out of my purse as possible. If I put a button there, it might catch on the inside of my purse and it'd be hard to pull it out. So that's why I don't have anything there. But that one's up to you because you're the designer. And if there are any questions about my little wallet, this is what the pattern looks like. I will tell you that Wonder Wallet by Lazy Girl, I don't know if you guys have heard, but Lazy Girl, um, Joan Hawley is an amazing designer. I've, I've taught a lot of her quilts and projects. The Margot bag is from Joan Hawley. Got started that class last night. Unfortunately, she passed away last year and her company is no longer gonna print her patterns, which is sad because there's some really good patterns. So if you see something from her, you might wanna grab it because once they're gone, they're gone. So that's the Wonder Wallet by, by um, 
Joan Hawley. Yeah, good stuff. All right. Any questions about that? Let me know. Paula has put up the handout and the favorites page. And if you have any questions, please comment. If you want to let us know where you're from, please comment. We've gotten people from Georgia and New Jersey, and I can't remember where else. Altamont Springs. All right. We are finally going to talk about this quilt behind me one more time. The handout. Gabriella has just put the handout on the um, on the comments, so you can click on that handout. It goes right to the right to the page you need. You can either print it, pull it up on another device, so you can follow along if you would like. And we are going to talk about this quilt here. So, um, so kind of a mid page here on this on the handout. I have given you a bunch of numbers. Really what they are is you can make these blocks any size. The larger the blocks, the larger those white squares, the less you need to make a decent size quilt, right? So I've kind of done the numbers for you. You know, if you want, if you want your little white square to be five inches square, you don't need very many to make a decent size quilt. If you want to make them two and a half, you're going to need a lot more. So I've told told you how many blocks you're going to need and what size quilt you're going to end up with. And then you get to decide. So the quilt behind me is three inch white squares. And so I don't have my glasses on me, but, but you can kind of figure that out three inches. So five and a half. So I cut all the colored rectangles five and a half and all the white squares three inches. So the math works and I'll show you how to sew it all together. Um, since she's, she's scanning here, I'm just going to tell you I've quilted it with a large loop-de-loop -loop design and I just put some fleece on the back and of course my lovely black and white um, binding that I love because it goes with everything. All right, so we are going to go do an overhead, Gabriella, and this, um, we could call this a, a single patch, it's, even though it's two pieces, but really there's your square. There's your rectangle, just like just like the handout. We're going to call this we're going to call this A, right? Actually, what we're going to call A is we sew two of those puppies together. I can't take these apart. Um, and there it is. There's A, right? White color, white color. We're going to sew another one just like that, just like that. And if we flip it around, that's B, and we sew those together, and there it is. There's a block. Super simple. And then you make as many of those as you want to make. Um, as, as much as you have fabric, I'll be honest, this fabric was left over from um, a log cabin quilt that I made a couple years ago and it was sitting in a pile. I've said this before, but if you have, if you've made a quilt and you have a decent amount of fabric left, instead of taking, you know, the whites and put it back in the white pile and the purple and back in the, keep it all together in a Ziploc bag. And the next time you need a smaller project, like, oh, you know, a tote bag or a pillow, you know those fabrics all went together, so make something else with them. So that's what I did. And I used up every single scrap of bright fabrics that I had. I threw in um, a single white neutral. You could have, you could put lots of different neutrals in there, but I just chose to use one just to keep it continuous, keep the continuity. So Jacksonville, Florida. I'm actually camping in Jacksonville on Wednesday. Michelle, uh, Catherine Hannah Beach, which I've never, Catherine Hannah Park, I've never been there before. Um, Jaybird Quilt has joined up with Lazy Girl. That is great news. Well, thanks for letting me know. So I'm, I'm hoping her quilts will continue to um, survive and her, her uh, patterns because she d does have some great, great ideas. She did have some great ideas. I think I saw her here once actually. She's doing a little presentation here. Um, all right, so if you don't have any questions about bright blocks, we are going to move on to the next handout. By the way, we're going to put up that handout um, one more time. The link, if you just joined us, there's a link uh, that, that Gabrielle is going to put up and you click on it. It will take you to a three page handout. I would encourage you to either print it out or bring it up on a second device. And um, yeah, what was I going to do? Oh, yes. All right. New story. So we were given um, purses a few years ago for Christmas gifts, and I loved them. I love the color. However, it was just one big hunk and hole of a, of a bag, and I like my bags to be a little more organized. So I decided it's time to make a purse organizer. 
And that means that I, it's got lots of pockets. There's two pockets inside, two pockets outside. And this is something that I can drop in and um, use, to, use to organize this bag. And then when I'm done with the bag or I want to switch, I could just take everything that's in the organizer and switch it to the next bag. So just a very simple, and I'm calling it a tote organizer because I do have some men, two, I had two men this morning at the at the face-to-face uh, -face events. And you might be looking and saying, I don't carry purses, but I carry totes. So there you go. Um, this is a tote organizer. So I've got a couple different great tips I want to show you in regard to this. So let's get started. First of all, um, it's got four pockets, two on the inside, two on the outside. I used a different color on the inside than I did on the out. You might recognize the Cafe Facet fabric. Um, you don't have to use two different colors. You can use the same color. Um, here is another, actually I made two others. This is also, I used soft and stable with this and I did with this too, but this is a little stiffer and I'm afraid to tell you, I, it was so long ago that I made it. I can't remember why I made it so stiff. That's embarrassing. I probably shouldn't even show that to you. This one is made out of felt and um, I decided I didn't like it. I, I found a tutorial online and she was going on and on about felt. But to make it strong and thick enough, I had to use two layers. So I fused them together and I didn't like the way they acted when I sewed, when I fused them together. So um, I love felt for other projects, but maybe not for this one. Um, so that's the felt one. But this is soft and stable. If you've never used soft and stable, it is the most awesome um, product. I believe it's by Annie, which is a pattern company that makes a lot of great purse patterns. And I like it for many reasons. Number one, it, well, it, it's exactly what it is. It's soft and it's stable. Um, if I had pressed this properly, I should have done that during the break. If I had to press this bottom properly, then this would stand up all by itself, no problem. In fact, I use this for tote bags when I want the tote bags to stand up. And I also like it because it's stable. Not only does it stand up, but you can use this as the bottom layer for when you're doing quilt as you go, you know, sew a strip and then sew another one and flip and sew and flip. It's called quilt as you go or sew and flip. And you can use this on the bottom because there's no fuzzy stuff like batting to get into your feed dogs and your bobbin case and mess up your machine. So I make tote bags quite often that way, using up my leftover little, my Ziploc bag of little leftover strips. And then I can just sew two squares together, two rectangles and make a tote bag. So super easy to work with. Just, I, I can't say enough about soft and stable. I use it as often as I can. Um, so let me, let me go, let's go back to pockets. Cause I've had some, I have some good information on pockets. So I want to do that before anything else. So uh, what a, a pocket, if I want to make a pocket, okay. If you want to make a pocket this size, I'm going to need a piece of fabric twice that size. And I, I'm to be honest, I think my fabric's a little bit short, but here's my fabric. Whatever size pocket I want, I want to actually fold it in half. That's going to be my actual pocket. So you got to make it twice as big. I like to use um, heat and bond fusible web to, um, to stabilize my pocket. A pocket just like this is a little wimpy, even though it's two layers. It's just a little too wimpy for me. I want something, I want a pocket that's a little stiffer and a little stronger. So I have found that if I cover, I feel like I should have one here. I had one here, but maybe, sorry, it has disappeared. I had a piece of fabric with some state, with some hot heat and bond right on top of it. And I think I might have accidentally thrown it away. So I got my fabric. I'm going to put a layer of heat and bond. I'm going to fuse it together. If you're not familiar with heat and bond, it's a fusible web as opposed to fusible interfacing. Fusible interfacing, you still fuse it to your fabric, but it stays in your project. Fusible web is basically a piece of paper with some glue that's activated when you fuse it, when you iron it. So I'm going to put my fusible, uh, fusible down, iron it. The thing about fusible, like heat and bond, you have to wait not just five or 10 seconds for it to cool down. I would wait two or three minutes till it's completely gelled before I start taking the paper off. So here it is. 
I've lost my lost my other demo here, but I I pressed it, pressed the fusible on, folded in half, so so, and then so almost. I need a little hole to turn. So here it is. I sewed, 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 and there's my hole, and the, the paper is still on it. So the next step, and by the way, this is all written down. The next step is to tear my paper off um, of my. This just gets thrown away, but that you can see. Hopefully you can see it's a different color because it's got the fusible glue on it. And that glue, I'm going to tear most of this. And if I was at home, I'd tear every little bit, bit off. But since I'm not at home, I'm just going to leave some of this in the seam allowance just to save a little time. Throw it in my new trash can. <laughs> um, okay, so now I can put my finger in the turning. Oh, I got to clip the corners. So let's do that real quick. A little tip on clipping your corners. Instead of just cutting across, let me put it on white so you can see me. Instead of just cutting across like this, I like to cut what I call a little, a little bird. I cut a triangle there and a triangle there. So it looks, it's going to end up looking like that, if you can see that. And this one got a little mashed while I was sewing it, so it's not going to look as pretty. And then I'm going to cut one more little triangle off there. This one is my turning, so I don't really want to cut anything off of that yet. So now it's finally time to flip this right side out. Once I do that and poke out the corners really well, I either use my, my fingertip to poke out the corners or better yet, some kind of turning device. I just don't have it with me today. I got three corners to push out. There we go. And now I've got this little guy. I need to tuck this in, but there's fusible on it. So once I tuck it in and kind of finger press it, I can go ahead and press this with an iron. Once you press that with an iron, it's done. You cannot say, oh no, I needed to push out this. It's too late. It's, it's permanent because you got two layers of fusible in there. So make sure it's just the way you want it. Poke out a better corner and press. Okay. I don't even bother sewing that closed because you're going to get that in the next step. Okay. Let's say you've made all your pockets and you want to install them on your bag. So this bag is actually, let's call it the lining of the bag, right? So, sorry about that. Here we go, back to the, back to the overhead. Um, so think about it. This is the top of your pocket, right? This is the top of the pocket, and that's the top of the pocket because it's gonna fold and that'll be the top. So don't put the, don't put the opening in the wrong place. Um, and you might've gotten a peek here at what my next step here. Before I sew my pocket down, I'm gonna put two little pieces of fusible trico, which I wanna talk about for just a moment. Let's do a, let's do a regular shot, Gabriella. This is a piece of yardage of fusible trico. We carry it in black, white, and ecru. And I will buy a yard every once in a while. I'll take it home and I'll immediately cut a bunch of strips out of it. Not the whole thing, but I'll cut, you know, 10 strips and they're one and a half inch pieces just with my rotary cutter real quick. I'll cut some strips. So this goes in my interfacing box and this goes into my top drawer of my sewing room, just a big pile, throw it in there. Um, every time I need it for a band-aid or for a scotch tape or not band-aid, a scotch, you know, tape or something like this, it's easy to pull out a strip, cut a square off with my handy dandy scissors and um, fuse it down. So what am I doing here? These are little squares that I'm gonna fuse down to the back of where the pocket's gonna go. And then once it's fused down, I'm gonna sew my pocket on. Um, and what I've done here is I've stabilized the base fabric. Let me just back up for a second and tell you a little story. When my daughter was young, I used to make her and her friend little matching dresses every year. And it was usually a bodice with a ruffled skirt attached. And then I make patch pockets. And, you know, she'd come in from collecting rocks or whatever. And the patch pockets would have torn out of the per of the skirt. And so I learned this trick, but also how to sew the pockets on so I don't have... Um, if you just have a straight line there, it's the pocket is more likely to, to pull out, right? But if you have a little triangle there, it's less likely to pull out that patch pocket. So I have a little picture here, just don't move anywhere. So I drew this this morning. The outside line is the pocket and the inside line is my stitching. So actually I start my stitching down here 
do a little diagonal line, go across about three or four stitches and then come down, across, up, over two or three stitches and then down in another diagonal. And so I feel like that is much more secure and less likely to have the pocket tear out of the bag. Hopefully that made sense. If not, you have re that's what you have rewind for. Yep, Catherine Hand has a great park. Um, looking forward to camping there for three or four nights, four or five nights. Okay, so now I've got my lining. All right, now we're ready to assemble the bag. I'm going to start with a piece of soft and stable. I'm going to put my lining right side up. Again, this is all in the handout. And then I'm going to put my outer fabric. This just didn't have any pockets because it doesn't. But um, that's my outer bag. I like to use Wonder Clips at this point. So I'm going to go grab a few. I don't know if you're familiar with Wonder Clips, but you know, for years I thought, I don't need Wonder Clips. I have pins, I have binder clips, but once you get them, you use them for everything. So Wonder Clips all around, it's just easier and pins sometimes um, sh make things shift, but Wonder Clips uh, pin them exactly where you want them. Also, if you're not familiar with Wonder Clips, they have a bottom and a top. The top is colored, the bottom is super flat. So when you're sewing something, you want that bottom against your sewing machine. So this is kind of my, my um, note to myself that I'm sewing from the top as opposed to flipping it over and sewing it from the bottom. I didn't pin that very well. Anyway, we're going to sew all the way around except for a turning hole on one of the sides. All right. Which I have done here. Where's my turning hole? There's my turning hole, I think. Yes, there's my turning hole. I'm also going to clip the corners a little bit. I'm not going to do that right this second because I just want to show you that you're almost done. So it's, it's it looks like a weird bag, but we're actually going to fold this fold this in half and sew up the side seams and it will turn itself into a bag, I promise. So here we are. This is what I call birthing the bag um, through the little birthing hole. And hopefully that doesn't cause too much pain for me to say that. Some of us have had better luck than others. Um, so I'm poking through all four corners. Okay, so at this point, it doesn't look like much. I would hit this with an iron. And by the way, soft and stable comes with no fusible, or you can get one side fusible, or you can get both sides fusible. So if you've got something with fusible, Again, when you go to press this, like that pocket, you better you better know what you're doing. You better, you know, okay, final answer. This is the way I want it. If there's any place to poke out or any place to fix, do it before you press because that's a, that fusible product is not going to come undone. So at this point, you kind of fussy fuss with that a little bit, get everything looking good, press it down. Again, you do not need to sew that whole close. You're going to get it with the top stitching. Let's just pretend I did it. So let's pretend I pressed it. Um, you can top stitch the top there and the top there, or you can wait till it's a finished bag either way. Um, and now let's say the purple is my outside of my final product. The purple is the outside. So I'm going to put, put it right sides together and I'm going to sew up the sides. And you can use this the tiniest seam allowance possible because you've already got finished edges there's nothing to hide. So you could just tiny little edges. That's exactly what I did here. Um, you can see this color. This it looks almost looks like a French seam, but that's that's my side edges. But I just used like an eighth of an inch. Um, I didn't want to take any more from the bag into the seam allowance. I just made the tiniest little seam allowance here, sewed up the sides. Now I want to talk about another tip here. You can leave it just the way that is, I think. So the, this is the side of the bag. Here's the top, here's the side. Um, and I wanted to define the sides of my bag. I've been doing that lately with totes and purses rather than just having something that looks like this where it's kind of mushy and gushy. Um, I mean, I did press it, but I don't know how long that fold is gonna stay pressed. But here I decided, I mean business. I decided where my corner was, I could have come out a little more but I folded the fabric wrong sides or lining sides together and I sewed with my walking foot, just a tiny little top stitch across that or by that fold. And I did it four times and then I boxed my corners. That way I didn't have to sew this all the way to the end. I just sewed it mostly to the end and the boxing the corners hides 
hides the finish there. So I just think that that um, defines the sides a little more and makes it makes it behave itself a little more. Again, if I had pressed the bottom, and um, you could even sew that, but if I had to press the bottom, this probably would stand a little better. If I put something in it, it'll probably stand a little better. So any questions, please let me know. Hi, Faye. Glad we missed you this morning. I'm come back next time. Uh, see you in August. Okay, so if there's any questions about that, I would love to hear about them. And oh, I have one more thing. Oh, two more things I want to share with you. So um, keep commenting, keep talking to us. I put all this away. Da, 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 da. So that's it for the handout, but I have a few more things to talk about. Let me know if you have questions. <coughs> All right. So if you've ever taken my machine quilting class, uh, most of what I'm about to tell you, you've heard, but it's always good to hear it again. Um, so we're going to talk about thread and how thread comes off your machine um, in different ways. One more thing to grab. Whoops. So there are basically three different kinds of spools of thread. You have something called stack spools and Jabrielle, if you want to do a close-up on that this is from yli which we don't carry but but you get the idea this is a stack spool it stacks up and then stacks down another very popular stack spool is a king cut um, I, you can tell that i really like my variegated threads I'll, I'll get them whenever i can find them so those are stacked spools stay right there the other way to go is something called um uh, ugh, Crosswound spools, which I have some sulky, I've got some metler, and I've got some invisifil, and they're kind of wound up really funny. But basically, they go up fast and down fast. You got all these V's, you got all these crosses in the in the thread in the on the spool. So, if you're not having any problems, you can switch it back. If you're not having any problems sewing, your retention is fine, everything looks good, then no worries. But if your thread is breaking or shredding or you're having tension issues, this might be something you want to think about. If, it, if you're using a stacked spool, it ideally would like to be on a vertical pin. Um, some machines come with just vertical spool pins and some machines come with just um, horizontal pins, right? So first of all, you got to know which, which your machine has. And then, of course, some machines have take cones, which is really nice because you can get a lot more thread for the same amount of money with a cone. Um, so again, if you've got a vertical spin, vertical pin, try to be thinking about stack spools, horizontal spin, pin, you want to think about crosswound. Well, what if you want the best of both worlds? What if you've got some of both kinds and you don't want to get rid of any thread? Um, then you can get a little product that we carry. It's on my favorites page. And I'll be honest, they flew out the door. I think I have one or two packages left, but we will get more, I promise. And what this is, it's called a horizontal spool feeder, but actually it'll work both ways. Somebody asked me today, how do you put it on your machine? Um, and I will show you how you put it on your machine. Get the other one out of here. Let's say you have a vertical pin on your sewing machine and you want a horizontal because you want to use your crosswound spools. So you would just put it on there and it's kind of uh, teeth on the inside. So you kind of pull it till it's tight. And now you can use your horizontal pinned thread, your, your um, crosswound spools. I should back up and say, before I continue with that, here's a really good visual. If you have a stack spool and it's up and down and the thread is coming off your, your thing and it's doing great, but if you take a stack spool and you put it on a horizontal pin, what happens here? Every time you take it off that spool, you introduce another twist in your thread. And that thread still has to go through your tension discs and your needle and your dick up lever and all that. And by the time it's made it all the way through, it's tired and it shreds or it breaks on you. So that's a really good visual for what's happening when you put the wrong thread on the wrong or the right thread on the wrong pin which is why this gives you an option to have both kinds. Um, and then of course, if you have a horizontal pin on your sewing machine, 
you can turn you can turn it into a vertical pin just by putting the same thing on that. So it's vertical and horizontal depending on what you're trying to do. Let's just talk real quick about cones. If you have a machine that takes cones, I personally, I have two machines that take cones. My Janome 6700 takes cones, which is awesome, as well as my um, Juki 2200 um, sit down machine. But sometimes I want to use, and by the way, cross wound spools work on cones as well. So it works on a pin, horizontal pin and a cone because the thread comes up um, this is the wrong one to choose because you can't it's invisible you can't even see it uh, so the thread um, either comes either comes up like a cone or sideways with a horizontal in either case you're in good shape um, so cones if you really want to use cones and your machine doesn't take cones then i'm going to recommend the Superior Threads thread holder. There are many different ones out on the market. And I know this is a, costs a little bit more. It's $34.95. It's a little more than the other ones. However, you can, there's a little metal uh, arm that swings up. So your thread comes through this little hole and up to the wire and over to your machine. But the beauty of this one is it has a vertical pin and a horizontal pin. This one, this one comes out if you use this one and vice versa. Actually, on my, this is a new pin. For me, I take this pin, I unscrew it from here, and I screw it into the side hole here. So I can use this metal pin on either one. And then they have the different size holders to keep your, to keep your, your, from, their piece from floating, for your, your spool from running away from you. So it's well built. I've had mine for 10 or 15 years. Um, it takes every kind of thread, a cone, horse, uh, cross wound, stacked it uses every kind of thread it works depending on how you set it up so the superior thread holder we've got a couple left on my favorites page we will definitely order more but one of these two things is going to work well for you is there anything to keep the spool from sliding off the open end of the spool pin well thank you for asking um i love you know i don't get a chance to watch Catherine or their five minute fridays every single week but a few months ago she did one on spool pin covers and i learned something um if you have a small spool like that one, like this one, um, yep, let's do a close up. So if you've got a small spool, then you're going to want to use your small spool cover. Um, if you were Sandy or who was asking me, if you were, um, if you look in your little box of little gadgets that came with your sewing machine, Claire, you're going to find some different spool caps of different sizes. So. Um, when Catherine was talking about it, and let's just say, oops, let me get this out of here. Um, let's just say you have a horizontal spool, and you there it is, horizontal pin with a spool, and you're sewing, and this thing wants to come off, which of course it would. So you're going to put your spool cap on here. But if you were to find a, your big spool cap, let's say it's two inches, there's different sizes. If you were to have a really big one there, she called it trying to climb Mount Everest. You're trying to go, the thread's got to come up over that spool cap to do its, to do its work. And that's hard and it puts extra tension on the thread. So her suggestion is if you have a small spool, you need to find your small uh, uh, spool cap. If you have a large spool, you're going to use your large spool cap. And then you're going to say, but I can't find any of my spool caps, Mary Janine. Well, do what I just did two days ago. I came in and bought some new spool caps because mine have flown off into the nether regions of my sewing room. And rather than looking for days for them, I just came in and got a $2, $1.99 spool cap. So get yourself some new spool caps. But mostly think about the size. Um, spools you have if they're very big you're going to want a larger spool cap if they're very small you're going to want a smaller spool cap that's how you do it do you ever use spool netting you know i was just thinking i should talk about netting so thank you for asking um so what is netting you ask um we sell these little little tiny round it's like a column of netting um and you put them on your thread especially for embroidery when you're working with very slinky thread, this is a rayon and it's pretty slinky. So sometimes, you know, instead of one piece coming off, just I get a whole glob pulp coming off 
coming off the um, spool and then it makes a big mess. So what the net does, you put it on like this and the thread can still come off or really like this. It'll still come off, but it, um, it, hold, it slows it down and the net only allows a little bit of thread to come at a time instead of a big old glob. And again, we're just talking about the shiny embroidery thread. I've never had to use a thread net for cottons or cotton looking polyester, but for those, tr those shiny trilobal polyesters and so forth, you're definitely gonna want a thread net if you're having problems with your thread feeding out. So did we have any other good questions? before I put all my toys away. So hopefully that made sense with the um, with the ribbon. I love this. I got this idea from Superior Threads. They do have some great, if you want to learn more about thread, superiorthreads.com has some great videos teaching you more about thread and needles that we really, it's not very sexy, but it's, it's something we all need to be educated on. And uh, these machines are so so complicated. It's like, can't I just throw any kind of thread on? Well, you could, but you're going to be happier if you use the right thread for the right project. And they've, they've got good videos for that. Okay. Uh, one more thing to talk about before I let you get on your way. So quick, quick, another quick story. I've got a lot of stories today. Um, some of you may know Susan Murphy. She is the one that started our Project Linus group um, uh, chapter which has five counties in central Florida. And she comes in every month to our little project Linus group here at the sewing studio. And she has another stack of six or seven or 10 quilts. And I swear they all fit in this bag. And finally one year, I'm like one month, I'm like, Susan, what is this bag you're carrying? She has, there's carries so much. And she told me it was the grab and go, grab and go pattern from GE designs. And so I ordered it and I had to make myself one because I love this bag. Um, it is the re it's made with soft and stable, but it's been sitting smushed underneath my desk, I'm afraid. And I put some stuff on top of it, not knowing. And so it's it's kind of smushed. But once you put stuff in it, it's it's a beautiful thing. So it's soft and stable on the inside, vinyl on the bottom. So it's not going to get dirty. So great for the beach. And then I used a really cute. Um, set of five inch squares that have a sewing theme. So if you look closely, I've got scissors, I've got spool ends, um, some flowers, some sewing machines, some spools of thread. So it's a fun little five inch square. It's not online. I don't know if that's something we can put online, but um, there's five or six left in the, in the stash up by the red, up by the, um, by where I've got everything else. But where behind the, behind the front, cutting table. We've got a stash of these. So a little bit more about this bag. Um, and I got a couple tips I want to tell you about. If you, again, if you're in the market for wonder clips, this is a really large wonder clip that I was, was very useful when I was making this bag. So it's super big. It's, it's the jumbo size, not even a large, it's a jumbo. And I think, I don't remember how many come in a container, but more than you'll ever need. Um, so that was very helpful, especially with these thick seams. Um, these are French seams on the inside, so the inside looks as good as the outside. And then the other tip is whatever vinyl you choose, I would I would pick up a color, a spool of thread with the vinyl color, because if you have any tension issues or if you have any problems with your seam, that that thread is going to show, and so that's where you want your that's the color you want to choose for your for your thread. Um, it's a fairly easy design to make. I've made bags, but she, she does a good job with it. I will tell you that she tells you how, you know, what size to cut all the pieces and parts, the, the two sets of handles and so forth and so on. But she doesn't tell you what size to cut the lining. I'm like, well, that's a problem. And then I realized it's a yard of lining and you use the entire yard of lining. You don't cut it any smaller. This is, this is one yard of of yellow lining. By the way, whenever I um, make bags, I try to make my handles dark because that was what gets dirty first. If there's any binding on a quilt or a bag, I'll make that dark. And then I try to make my lining light colored to make it easier to see what's inside and I don't need a flashlight inside my bag. So unless you have questions, I'm just going to highly recommend the grab and go tote pattern. If you need a bag to carry lots of quilts hither and yon, 
that's your that's your pattern. What methods do you use for keeping your thread spools from unwinding and make a big mess in your spool box? Good question. Some some of you may know that different spools have different ways of parking your thread. I better put my glasses on for this one. So the king tut, for example, let's do an overhead, Gabriella. The king and I have terrible fingernails, but these king tut. Ah, well, the top pops off completely, or I just loosened it. So now I can park my excess thread in that top and kind of push it down a little bit. And that's that's safe right there, right? That's not going anywhere. Um, as well as this type of spool, same thing. There's a little hole there and you can pop that top off and then you could park your thread in that little space. So that's one option. Um, let's see, I don't, you know, Coase and Clark, has always had that little notch on the side, which I'm not been a big fan of because it gets caught on your machine. But here, this is YLI. And also it's got the little space on top that you can park your thread and then close that like a little clamshell. So that's, you know, if all else fails, I do have um, a lot of embroidery thread that doesn't have a way to park it. And so there's um, a tape that we sell. It's a clear tape. It's either called Amazing Tape or Hugo's Amazing Tape. I'm pretty sure we have it. I don't know if it's on the web. I know we have it on the wall. And um, it sticks to itself, but it's not sticky like scotch tape. It's just a vinyl tape. But if you pull it around the um, spool and then just, just push it and just push it down, it sticks. And so all of my embroidery thread that doesn't have a way to be parked, I use that tape. So it's clear so you can see through it, but it's taped down so it's not gonna go anywhere. And then every once in a while, I look in here or wherever and there's a big hunk of loose thread and I just go in and cut it off and throw it away because I don't feel like working with each individual spool to clean it all up. So thank you for the question. Hopefully that answered your, yeah, clean up all your spools, fix them all one way or the other with a, you know, with a way to park it or with that Hugo tape. Other people use um, the little scrunchies, those little elastic scrunchies for the little ones. You can use that. Um, and I'm sure if you guys have other ideas, let me know because um, there's there's plenty of different ways out there to park your thread so you don't have a mess. Thank you for all your questions. Thanks for joining me. And if you have any, uh, yeah, watch it again. If you didn't quite catch something, watch it again and hopefully it all makes sense. And thank you for joining me. I will see you again in August if you're not taking a class with me. Take care. Bye-bye.